The Cranky Geek WebRTC Spring 2021 show is possible thanks to our sponsors. Google, Agora, Element, Dolby I.O., Twilio, and Ring Central. See the links in the description for more information. All right, and we're back. So when we t- I mentioned earlier uh, in the intro talk you know, about some of the new emerging use cases, uh, and this actually this talk is going to be about one of the harder parts of WebRTC and, and, and audio in particular is conveying music. Um, and uh, a lot of you might be familiar with Dolby uh, in that domain. You know, the, the, the Dolby brand for stereo, but they actually have um, some interesting real-time communications technology uh, in this area too. So I'm happy to welcome back uh, Paul Bausted, uh to talk a little bit about uh, how to use WebRTC audio um, in music applications. Take it away, Paul. Okay, thank you. So my name is Paul Bowstead, and I currently currently lead product and technical strategy for Dolby's cloud offering, Dolby I.O. So over the last year, the use of WebRTC for communications has grown very rapidly. We're seeing WebRTC being used for much more than voice and video conferencing. It's now being used heavily for telehealth, education, and online events like these. We're looking at these different applications and how we can improve the experience by optimizing audio and video capture processing to suit the use case. So why is it important to consider the application when designing your audio processing chain? Well, the communications and WebRTC community has been working on optimizing audio capture, focusing on voice for a long time. and We've got really good noise suppression, leveling, echo suppression techniques optimized for voice. Even within voice communication, you want to have different settings for different use cases. For point-to-point communication, you want to let more audio through as it gives you a feeling of presence. And in meetings or virtual environments, letting through too much environmental noise can be very disruptive and really leads to everyone just going on mute, which kills interactivity. These algorithms are great for voice, but what happens if you don't want to transmit voice? The current wisdom is really just to turn off all audio processing. In this presentation, we're gonna have a bit of a deeper look at the music use case as an example of optimizing the audio chain. And we'll talk about the different music use cases, initially focusing on delay considerations. And then we're gonna talk about how to improve music capture. There are many different online music use cases. And playing music online together is desirable when musicians can't get together because of COVID. Online music lessons have also become very popular and you no longer have to hire someone that's nearby. We're also working with social network companies that want to enable users to share music and play music with their friends and family and even stream music to followers with a low delay to enable interaction with the audience. We'll start with a discussion of playing interactive music online because it's obviously the most demanding use case. Playing music together has significantly tighter delay constraints when compared to talking. Studies have shown that musicians need to be less than eight and a half meters apart to play together acoustically. This corresponds to a delay of about 25 milliseconds between the musicians. That's, that's pretty quick, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, They can be further apart, but you have to have some sort of low delay sound reinforcement system. When you get further apart, it becomes increasingly difficult and very unsatisfying to play together. In comparison, um, for voice, a delay below 150 milliseconds is ideal. But with voice, you can still carry on a conversation with hundreds of milliseconds. So... To keep the delay below 25 milliseconds, there are a lot of things you have to consider. The audio interface delay includes both capture and render. And for native applications, you can get this delay below as low as five milliseconds if you use pro audio devices. But you're generally looking at 10 milliseconds for the very best consumer devices. But often it it can be over 50 milliseconds. Within WebRTC, if you get everything right, I've seen people get it as low as 17 to 20 milliseconds, but it's generally a lot higher. The codec algorithmic delay. Um, So the 
the default algorithmic delay for Opus is 26 and a half milliseconds with 20 millisecond frames, but you can get it as low as five milliseconds if you use two and a half millisecond frames, but you're going to be sending quite a high packet rate there. Network delay itself will depend on your carrier and access technology. It can be as low as five milliseconds for fiber and 21 milliseconds for ADSL based upon the data in the link below. In addition, you need about five microseconds per kilometer for transmission delay and a few milliseconds per network hop. The client will also have a jitter buffer to compensate for variation in delay so that you are continuously playing audio out of the speaker. If you're on a Wi-Fi network, your jitter buffer delay will generally be north of 25 milliseconds already. On a wide network, if the network is perfect, you can get it down to a couple of frames, um, but probably five to 10 milliseconds with two and a half millisecond frames is probably the lowest you can get away with, but it's generally gonna be higher. The key message here, while this use case is technically possible with pro gear and optical network setups, you're running at the edge with low jitter buffers and you should expect audio issues and periods of time where the delay is above 25 milliseconds. So really, at the moment, you need to be an enthusiast to do this, and we don't see this as a widespread use case. Yeah, that doesn't seem like it's going to be uh, practical for, for the general audience, at least. Yeah, it's, it's quite tough to get that delay down. You've got to look at each one of these um, different causes of delay to get there. So in the case where delay is above 25 milliseconds, there's some really interesting discussion in the reference below where musicians are able to cope with larger delays. For example, there are some music styles suited to a small additional delay, like playing in a laid back style. And there are some kind of workarounds where you can, such as master slave, where a master can play a percussive instrument and someone can play on top of it remotely. To the slave, it sounds like they're playing in sync, but the master hears the slave out of sync and, and has to ignore it. So really over 25 milliseconds, you can't jam together online normally. This doesn't mean that people don't want to play music in WebRTC, and we're coming across a lot of interesting music use cases that do work pretty well for consumers. One person playing music at a time is still definitely possible, and you can have musicians playing to listeners. This is very applicable to the music lesson use case. And there's a lot of social music use cases where people are sharing music with their friends. And also there are collab collaborative production apps where artists communicate while working on mastering a music track together. So what is the experience like using conferencing and WebRTC for music? Audio processing algorithms are usually on by default in conferencing services. And these algorithms are generally designed for voice and not great for music as we discussed before. Noise suppression causes distortion and gaps in the music. Echo suppression can cause ducking or dips in audio levels when there is voice interacting over the music. And automatic gain control focuses on audibility and consistent levels and will really interfere with the creative intent of music. There can be long periods of quiet music, but the musician doesn't want to be made louder. So in WebRTC and other conferencing services, you can't really tune these algorithms well for music. And if you Google, how do I get music to work well in conferencing apps, the solution is to turn everything off. Now, there are circumstances where turning off all audio processing algorithms does make sense. If the user has a professional setup with acoustically treated rooms, musical instruments wired up for good audio capture, and the user can listen and to a live monitor of the output and adjust gains as needed. In these cases, the users want to control the experience through their equipment with no additional audio processing. However, for non-professional setups with normal rooms with no acoustic treatment and consumer audio devices using headphones, without any additional audio processing, this can sound thin and lifeless. And our work with consumers tells us that users want music to sound better. So we've been engaging with consumers to find out what they value in terms of music enhancement. 
In late 2019, we released a free app on the Apple and Google stores to start experimenting with music capture enhancement. The app, the app allows users to record live and live stream audio and video. And they can apply a range of music enhancements to make the audio sound great without, without professional gear. So I encourage you to check out an AB demo on the link below or download the app and give it a try. This app's been a great way for us getting feedback from the community on what they value. Interestingly enough, we're finding it's been used in unexpected ways, and there's quite a few people using it to record voice. They like the way it makes their voice sound for podcasts and other applications. So we're now implementing these music enhancement features in Dolby IO in our interactivity client SDKs. And to get this working in the browser, um, we're obviously using the browser to access the device and WebAssembly to implement processing, the processing chain that you see here. And also we're using the RTC data channel so we can make codec and transport changes to, to suit the application as needed. More, I'm gonna go and talk through each of these blocks in the processing chain that we're implementing. I'm gonna talk about what we're doing in each of the processing blocks and any related user interface considerations when building an application for music and any WebRTC specific considerations that we're coming across during the integration. So for audio capture and render, it's important for us that we turn off all the device processing to get a raw microphone feed to our audio processing algorithms. Also, if we know the device ID, we can apply device specific tuning such as audio equalization to improve audio capture and render based upon the characteristics of the mic and speaker. We can also decide to use the device or browser's echo canceller or our own. From a user interface perspective, you really need a control to select between music and voice modes. We're working on an automatic mode, but it's, it's hard to tell what the user intent is. So it's important to have a switch anyway. It's also important to allow users to test the settings that they select before they start performing. So allowing them to play a small segment of audio and listen to the result is extremely important. For devices that allow low delay monitoring of the audio captured um, through on the microphone, through the headphones, it's gotta be very low delay. It's important to expose a control to turn this on. This really improves the experience um, when you're wearing acoustic isolating headphones. It's good to hear what you're playing and it, it disrupts it if it gets distorted by your headphones. Also, it's best practice to provide visual feedback on capture levels and also visual indications of clipping or any other issues. So the artist feels confident about the quality they're transmitting. One limitation of the WebRTC implementation is we don't have the exact device ID, the PID, VID. We just have a descriptive string. Um, so it's actually difficult to make device specific optimization. So we have to rely more on automatic means. With acoustic echo cancellation, in most cases, we assume musicians will want to hear or wear headphones for best quality and we'll want to switch off acoustic echo cancellation. However, we know sometimes people will still need echo cancellation, particularly kids in music lessons. So we're working on optimizations for echo suppression in the music use case. Some user interface considerations here are, um, for consuming use cases, you have to have echo cancellation enabled by default. Otherwise you'll just get howl. Otherwise you need to tell, however, you need to tell the user that the best experience is with headphones and provide an obvious control to turn it off. Harsh fricative sounds like shh and are a problem for both conferencing and, conferencing and music use cases with vocals, particularly close mic configurations. It's less important um, if the capture device is say a meter or so in front of you. Um, but people often sing quite closely into the microphone on a device. So equalization or EQ is a process of changing the balance of different frequency components in an audio signal to change the characteristics of music. A static EQ has sliders for different frequency bands, and this can be hard to tune 
and definitely hard to tune during a performance. And so we've developed a dynamic equalizer, and this performs equalization on a per audio frame basis, adaptively applying gains in order to achieve a targeted spectral shape. We offer a number of equalization profiles that are specifically tuned to match a music genre. We also have a dynamic range compressor, which will reduce the volume of loud sounds and increase the volume of soft sounds in a very short time scale. In voice conferencing, the goal of dynamic range compression is generally to make the conference participants sound audible with a consistent average loudness to improve intelligibility. In music, the feature is being used for artistic effect and is much more active. We aim to enhance the presence of the audio and give it a much tighter dynamic range. And obviously this is quite tied to the dynamic equalization setting. So the different style of music you choose will have a different dynamic range control. So spatial widening. Um, with voice communication, we render multiple voices in a conference or spatially to improve intelligibility with overlapping speech. This really allows for much more productive and, and engaging natural conversations. I spent time talking about this in the Frankie Geek presentation in 2019. Yeah, with music, yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed that discussion. I quite like talking about the, the spatial stuff which we've been doing. With music, the aim is to upmix mono capture to stereo to create a wide sound stage. This makes it more immersive, but people also expect to hear music in stereo, hear music wide in front of them. So I'm going to finish with some takeaways. So audio quality is very application specific. With voice, you want to do things differently for one-on-one -on -one versus group communication. With music jamming, the number one measure of quality is delay, and people are willing to deal with network-induced and CPU-induced audio artifacts to get there. In other interactive music applications, um, sounding good is the primary goal, and that's what we're focusing on here. The tools we're creating here can be used for more than music as well. We've got some customers, as I said, that really like the dynamic EQ settings to change the characteristics of their voice. They like the perceived quality that they get. WebRTC's audio processing algorithms are really not suited to these non-voice use cases. They can't really be configured to be suitable for the music use case, and it's really best to turn them off. And we've shown that you can improve the experience by implementing custom music processing in WebAssembly. We're in the final stages of integrating this processing into our WebRTC communications SDKs. We're really interested in working with developers who have music or just innovative audio applications in general. If you want to talk to us, um, you can go to the link on the page here. There's, we also have some free Dolby t-shirts to give away today. And you can get, there's a link to our virtual booth there as well. Thank you. Frankie Geek is possible thanks to Google, as well as industry sponsors. Dolby, the API platform for transforming media and communications. Element, talk to everyone through the open global matrix network, protected by proper end-to-end -end encryption. Ring Central, revolutionize your business communications with Ring Central APIs. Twilio, create real-time video apps that scale as you grow, from free one-to-one -one chats to larger group rooms. Agora. Embed vivid voice and video in any application, on any device, anywhere.